Hallelujah. We just want to lift up the name of the Lord and just praise Him and just welcome Him here into this place. Hallelujah. We need a renewing of His love and His anointing. Right now, if you can lift your hands, if you can lift your voice, if you can turn it all over to God. Right now, in Jesus' name, Lord. God, we love you. We come before you, Lord. Hallelujah. There's one church and one mind and one authority, Jesus. God, can you begin to move here in this place, Lord? Hallelujah. As our hearts are open, Lord.
Amen. It, it's a big killer. And I know for myself that it's not always uh, that, that there are times when I get very, very stressed. And it's never about what's going on right now. It's always about tomorrow. Amen. So this idea of tomorrow is something that people really uh, pursue. People get all kinds of ideas about astrology. Um, they try to tell the fortune with, uh, with uh, all kinds of little devices, a uh, crystal ball, all those kinds of things. But we know that you can only tell the future by what the Bible says. And the Bible says in detail events that have not occurred yet. And I want to talk um, a little bit about prophecy today. And I want to talk about the events of prophecy. And, and in doing so, uh, kind of set the stage for our understanding so that we know exactly what's going to happen. And um, that way we can think intelligently about tomorrow. I know for myself that before I became a Christian, uh, I worried about tomorrow for another reason. One was I didn't know where I was going. Or actually, I kind of did. I had a pretty clear idea. But I was always trying to figure out how to get around the situation. Somebody say amen. 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 Right? We're always trying to get around that. When we don't know Christ, we're always trying to get around knowing about tomorrow. So with this in mind, if we have, um, if we have an understanding of biblical events then you and I, we don't have to worry, right? We know that if we're bought with the blood of Jesus Christ, that if we repent, we're baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the power of the Holy Ghost, that God has us in the palm of His hands. I remember one time when, um, this was back in the 90s, early 90s, that, uh, that when when the uh, first Iraq war was started, that uh, I was, uh, you know, cable TV was first coming up. It was kind of the first, first time it was really a big deal, or at least I had it for the first time. And uh, CNN was on, and CNN was looking or was showing what was happening in Iraq. And the American forces made their first big push through these big berms and took their tanks and went into Iraq. And I was working the night shift and this occurred in the morning because in Iraq it was at night so they did this all at night when the, the Iraqis couldn't see. And as they were pushing through, the battle was commencing. And I woke up because I was, like I said, I was working the night shift and I woke up that morning and there on the TV was CNN. And all of these, uh, there were all these fires where all of these, these military vehicles were going up in flames. And do you know that I happen to know only one piece of scripture? And that scripture talked about uh, during the time of, of the Battle of Armageddon when all of the when all of the instruments of war would be piled up together and burning. And so when I saw that TV screen and I saw all those military vehicles on fire, I thought that the rapture had come and I was worried about being left behind. Can you imagine? I had that fear right there and then. It wasn't enough to get me over the other side. But I tell you what, it made me think. It made me think. And so today I want to go over some of the some of the events. I want to go over these things in order. Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Because what I want to talk about first is the coming of Christ for his saints. So the first, the first event that's going to occur uh, in God's calendar. Let me get these here. 
the first event that's going to occur is the, the, is the coming of Christ for his saints. Now, um, this is where he's going to take all of those who are in the church, where he's going to take them up to heaven. And this is known as the rapture of the church. Now, there are some who say that the word rapture is not in the Bible, and so therefore it's not a real event. And it's true that the word rapture is not in the Bible, um, but the word harpazo, which is the taking away, which is the catching away, excuse me, the catching away. So the word um, in the Greek is harpazo, and it means the catching away. And what they did was is they, they translated the Bible into Latin, and in Latin, harpazo is translated as rapturo. Right, which means a catching away. And then when they went ahead and they translated those texts, uh, they translated rapturo to rapture. So basically it means the same thing, the catching away. And so the rapture is this event. And the Bible tells us, look what it says here. It says uh, Paul is, is talking to Timothy, or excuse me, to the Thessalonian church. Now, the, Thessalon the Thessalonian church is this. Um, it, it, this is one of the first, this, the first and the second book of Thessalonians is one of the first two books that were written to, uh, were written to the church by Paul. And the problem at the time was is that the people were saying, hey, Jesus said he's going to come for us. Where is he? And so Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, was telling them this, watch, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, meaning those who are dead, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Now notice, if you don't have any hope, you're going to be what? You're going to be sitting in front of a CNN screen, right? And you're going to be crying because you're feeling left behind. But he said, this says if you're asleep, if you sleep with Jesus, in other words, it's a metaphor for, um, for being dead in Christ. Notice this. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede or in, in the uh, King James, prevent, right? But back those days, prevent means come before. So we will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus will we always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And so what he's saying here is, hey, he's saying, listen, Christ is going to come down in the clouds. He's not going to touch the earth, right? But he's going to come down in the clouds. The trumpet's going to sound, and the bodies of believers, all those who are dead, right? All those who are dead and uh, will come first. Then those who are alive are going to come right after them. And then uh, we're going to be taken up to meet him in the air. This is the rapture. This is what you and I live and die for. This is what some of our, our parents and our grandparents and even unfortunately some children have preceded us in death. And they await as we do. The rapture or the coming and the taking away of us up into heaven. Hallelujah. I'm waiting for that. Amen. Amen. I am waiting for that. But I want you to see that it happens in the blink of an eye. Turn to 1 Corinthians uh, 15. Do we have anybody working the media back there? No? Oh, that's right. The young ones are gone. All right. So 1 Corinthians 15. And then we want to go to verse 51.
Actually, let's go back to verse 50. Notice what it says here. It says, now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither death, neither doth corruption inherit any corruption. So he's saying, look, flesh can't do it. How many know that we, that our flesh can't make it, uh, make ourselves righteous unto God? Amen. So we can't do that. And it's corruption. Amen. We take showers and we all smell nice when we come in here. But, but if we were to cease functioning, it, it, you better hope it's January because it's going to start getting real ripe real quick. Amen. So corruption will not inherit incorruption. So behold, I show you a mystery. Now the word mystery in the Greek doesn't mean like what we mean. Right? When we mean a mystery, we mean something that's covered up and that we don't know. But in the Greek, a mystery is something that was hidden but is now revealed. Isn't this beautiful? Notice what it says. Behold, I show you a mystery. It changes it, right? Because it's going to show you something. It says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Hmm. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. The dead are corrupted. Their bodies are rotting in the ground. But this says that at the rapture, everybody's going to be raised incorruptible. They're going to be fixed. They're going to be pure. The problems that they had on this earth will not be in heaven. Amen. And it said that it's all going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. That means like that. And it says, for this corruptible, meaning this foul body, must put on incorruption, purity. And this mortal must put on immortality. We have to. We have to be changed from dead to alive. Go to verse 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, in other words, the change, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Is, notice it says here in verse 56, the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. Why? Because we cannot keep ourselves good enough. Ever come out of church, got into traffic and we'll leave it there. Amen. You got into Sunday afternoon traffic. Or maybe you went to go eat and you got bad service or something like that. Or maybe Monday you woke up because you had a great Sunday, right? And all of a sudden, you started acting up a little bit. Your flesh kind of went a little haywire. Come on, somebody. Amen. Some of you are smiling. You know what I'm talking about. The other ones, you good poker face. Amen. It happens. Why? Because flesh cannot put on purity. Amen. We, we, the flesh wants what it wants. And if you don't believe that, try fasting. You want to eat. The flesh has its own desires. And the flesh wants, it wants to get somewhere fast. It wants to look at what it shouldn't look at. It wants to take things that it shouldn't take. It wants to get its hands on things that it shouldn't. Those are desires of the flesh. But we are going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye to wanting God's will, to wanting the things that God has for us. I don't want to be in this body anymore. Amen. And now that I have Jesus, when I see things like that on TV, when I see wars and rumors of wars, I say, come on, Jesus. Hallelujah. Because ultimately, I'm going to be translated. My children are going to be translated. We're going to live with Jesus Christ forever. And there's a beauty to that. Why? Because
because we won't be trapped in the flesh anymore. What does it say? Corruption is put on incorruption. And, and when it says, when it says, death, where is thy sting? And what it's trying to get us to understand is that the law is against us. It shows us what's the matter with us. And that's the beauty of it, but that's the sting. And he says, where is that sting? It's gone because where there is purity, there is no sting. And where there is no sin, there is no death. Amen. He wants us, he wants to return us to the state. You have to understand, these things that are going to happen in the future, this prophecy that occurs, this new heaven and new earth, the whole reason for it is that God is returning us to the state that we were in with Adam and Eve before they ate of the fruit. Do you understand that? In other words, that's the whole reconciliation process. You, you, ever, have, um, you ever have a problem with your parents, right? You, you, going way back, right? You, you may, perhaps there was some bad blood with a parent or something. I know for myself, me and my dad, we had a we had a big problem in high school. Big problem. I had something against him, and he was like, he didn't understand it. But for years, I I couldn't really embrace my father. It was my issue. It was my problem. But we had a, a cleansing at one time. And I told him exactly what was on my mind. And he said, I had no idea. But we had that cleansing and it brought it back to the way that our relationship was before. And that's what God wants with us. It's, it, it's why all these things must happen. It's why he died for us. So that he could pay the price for our sin. So we could all of a sudden, that we could have this cleansing with him. And by having that cleansing, he changes our life. And that's what the gospel's about. So the book of Revelation and all this, all this um, prophecy stuff is not scary for those who are in Christ. Why? Because now we're going to go back to that same space that Adam and Eve had with the Lord. And they walk with him in the cool of the garden. Hallelujah. I know that I'm going to be with Jesus one day. Amen. Amen. Now the second thing is the great tribulation. Let's turn to Matthew 24. Turn to Matthew 24 and verse 5. Now, after the rapture of the church, the, um, the earth is going to experience a time. It's a seven-year period uh, of great suffering and sadness, and this is known as the tribulation. The second half is known as the great tribulation. And during this time, the Jewish people are all going to be returned to their land, even though they're going to be returned in a state of disbelief. They're, gonna, they're already starting to come back. They've been making great strides over the last 50 years, and they've been coming back in droves. Amen. Now, at the same time, there's a, an evil leader called the Antichrist. Let's, um, let's go through Matthew 24 and verse 5. It says this, and these are the signs of the end time. And it says, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Amen. Anybody paying attention to what's going on in um, Ukraine and China? Here, here's the thing, folks. I, I don't think you know how close we're getting. A missile was fired into Poland yesterday. So what? Here's the problem. Vladimir Zelensky... The president of Ukraine said that the Russians fired a missile into Poland. Well, guess what? Poland is a member of NATO. And there's an article in NATO's contract with each of the countries. I think it's Article 5. 
And Article 5 says that an attack on one of the countries of NATO is an attack on all of the countries of NATO. And Vladimir Zelensky said, he said, Russia fired a missile into Poland. NATO needs to attack. And if NATO attacks, guess what? Russia has nuclear weapons and we have nuclear weapons. I lived in Europe for 10 years, believe me, I understand. You, you, you know what the word tinderbox is? You know what a tinderbox is? It's a box with all kinds of dry wood in it, and you put a match in it, go straight up. Now NATO said, well, hang on, because it's true. A missile did go into Poland. NATO investigated, and they found out that that missile came from the Ukraine. Do you realize how close we came to an all-out war based on a lie? Folks, wars and rumors of wars. This is getting close. Notice, where are we at? Verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Yesterday, there was the third strongest earthquake in Texas history. It's a 5.3. Just saying. Pestilences. COVID-19, anybody? All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Do you know what the beginning of sorrows is? That is, a, that is a Greek word for when a woman has Braxton Hicks. And what is Braxton Hicks? It's when a woman is pregnant and she's about to give birth and she gets false labor pains. How many know that this earth is convulsing? There's an awful spirit on this world. These are the beginning of sorrows. And they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. How many know that Christians are being put in jail for, for teaching and preaching biblical truth? There was a man, there was a pastor in the church of Sweden who preached that only men and women can be, uh, and this was two years ago, only men and women can have a marriage. You know he was charged with a criminal offense? In the UK, if you say things like that on, on uh, 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 public media or social media, excuse me, you know the police can come around to your house and caution you? It's like the police coming to your house and telling you, if you keep doing this, we can arrest you. And it goes on your record. I'm just saying. And then many shall be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. How many know that people are more easily offended nowadays than ever? This is talking about the church here. People get offended in church. Folks, we have to guard our hearts. If you're offended, go tell somebody. Tell them with love. Hey, you hurt me. Because there, there's the problem right there. When somebody hurts you, and they, we call it being offended, right? But we don't say what's really underneath it. What's really underneath it is that we're hurt. And somebody's taken something away from us. Why can't we tell somebody, hey, I wanted it done this way, or I felt this way, and you said something different or did something, and that's hurt me. Why can't we do that? It's because of our pride, not the offense of the other person. We are always, always, when we look at Jesus Christ's example, we are always under the unction of going to somebody and asking them. See Matthew 18, what, how, why did you do that to me? Why did you hurt me? And see, this is how churches can be undone. Let's go to verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, 
The love of many shall wax cold. How many know that word wax means grow? How many knows that love in this world is growing colder? But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Hallelujah, folks. I just want you to know, listen, God is not looking for you to be perfect, but he's asking you just to endure. Hallelujah. Hey, if you have kids, you'll figure that out pretty quick. Amen. They'll work on your last nerve and then you've got to, you've got to just endure to love them. Why? Because you wake up the next day and whatever, whatever you were bothered about, guess what? You're still going to love them. Amen. And that's how God loves you. Amen. And this gospel, verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. And I want you to notice what happens here. This is the abomination of the desolation. This is during that time. Amen. When the Antichrist comes in and when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet stand in the holy place means the temple. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them with that give suck in those days. But pray that your flight shall not be in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation. This points to the beginning, or excuse me, the middle uh, of the, 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 the three and a half year mark. And for there shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor shall ever be. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved. But for the elect, that means the chosen, say the, the, the Jewish people who believe, it says, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ. Or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Folks, don't, don't count on making it through the, the rapture and all of a sudden going, hey, you know my auntie who never missed church and that brother who was always doing stuff at church, they're gone. That means the rapture came, I'm going to believe. Why? Because the Antichrist is going to come with signs and wonders. Amen. You need to know that when, that when the, 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 to the, excuse me, the magicians, that when they, saw, uh, when they saw Moses turn water into blood, they did the same thing through magic tricks. When they saw uh, the... the when they saw Moses turn his cane into a, a snake, they did the very same thing. There are going to be lying signs and wonders. Amen. And there, if it were possible, they would deceive the elect. 25. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chamber. Believe it not. He's talking about looking for for Christ for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west so shall be the coming of the son of man shall be man be so they're talking about the second coming there and they're saying listen don't go anywhere he's going to come back but he's going to come back on his terms verse 28 we're almost done here uh, with, with this part for wheresoever the carcass is there will the eagles be gathered together. Here's the coming of the Son of Man. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Can you imagine? You've got this seven years of tribulation just ending the, 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 um, 
the, the, the last three and a half years, and all the stars are going to fall out of heaven. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect, his chosen, hallelujah, from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Folks, I want you to know that when the Antichrist comes, he's going to demand all kinds of adoration. This is at the beginning of this era. He's going to demand that we worship him. Folks, if you think, oh, I'm not going to do it. Think about what, what's gone on in the last few years. How the media and uh, the structures at work and everybody are trying to press you into thinking one way. It's thinking one way. Now listen. Whether you believe in, in COVID shots or not is not, what, is not my issue. Some people have them and that's a good thing. Amen? But you, it should be your choice. Your body, your choice, right? <laughs> Amen? That's what they say. That's what they say. But notice how, here's the problem. It's the pressing. It's the pressing of everyone to believe one way. That's the problem. If you have a shot, God bless you. If you don't have a shot, God bless you. Same thing. Not my business. Not up to me to tell you what you ought to do. And it darn sure isn't my boss's. But again, it's not even the point. It, what, the point is pressing everybody into believing one thing. And that's what the Antichrist wants. He wants everybody believing one thing. They want everybody's eye off the ball. Notice they're not taking you to Bible study at work. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes, sir. Please do. Absolutely. Right now we have the Holy Spirit to give us discernment. Mm -hmm. And once we enter the, the seven year tribulation, it's beyond our powers. Then the Spirit has been lifted up. Yes. And we're not able to discern. Mm. Yeah. To press your point a little further, you know, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 said that he's gathering his elect. Well, if I don't go, then I'm not his elect. Do we think that in our flesh that we're going to be able to make that decision for him? We can't. We can't. And we're not his and we won't be his. So that's a good point, brother. Thank you. Thank you very much. It helps me to draw a little distinction there. Amen. So in the first half of the... Um, let me, let me just say this. In the first half of the, of the, uh, of the tribulation, the seven years, the Antichrist is going to try and convince the Jewish people that he's their friend and he's, that he's going to protect them. However, at that midpoint, right? Remember it said, if you're in, the, in, the, in Judea, flee to the hills, right? He's going to turn on them and he's going to show them exactly who he is. And the problem is this. The, the, the third temple is going to be built, right? The third temple is going to be built. It's going to be ready for sacrifices. And then what is he going to do? He's going to go into that place of the three and a half year mark, and he's going to declare himself God. 
and he will turn on the Jews. And that's where the persecution and the battles, like nothing that's been ever seen in history, is going to ramp up and it's going to get even worse. Amen. But God will preserve those Jews who have been faithful. Why? Because God is going to root. The Bible says that, that at the time of the fullness of the Gentiles, guess what? The scales are going to fall from their eyes and they're going to see Jesus. The book of Zechariah chapter 12 says that they're going to see Jesus as he was and they're going to understand that he, they were the ones who, who persecuted and killed him and they're going to repent. Praise the Lord. They're going to come and believe. And all of this is going to end with the Battle of Armageddon. Take a look at Malachi chapter um, 4. Malachi chapter 4 is the last book of the, of the Old Testament. Watch what this says. Malachi chapter 4. And see what it says about the War of Armageddon. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. Sounds like nuclear war, huh? And all the, all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it should leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. How do you know? How do you know that it's that it's. That, that it's that battle of Armageddon. Well, take a look in verse 5. It says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Dreadful. Dreadful. In other words, that feeling that you have when Monday's coming. Come on. Hallelujah. You, you got bills coming and you're going to get X out of your job. You feeling terrible. And the doctor said, no, I don't want the appointment on Wednesday. I need to see you tomorrow. Right? You know what's coming. And that's that day. Hallelujah. Okay, so. At the end of the tribulation period, Jesus Christ is going to come back again. So we want to talk about the, um, the coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ. And, um, and he comes back along with those who were taken up in the rapture. He's going to come back. Anybody ever heard that we were, we're going to rule and reign with him in his kingdom? Well, that's what this is about. We're going to rule and reign. This is known as the second coming of Christ. And, um, and what's going to happen in the second coming of Christ? Let's turn to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 1. I want you to notice what happens. Um, let me turn to that. Revelation chapter 20. Verse 1. Now what's going to happen is he's going to destroy his enemies, uh, including the Antichrist. He's going to judge the nations that persecuted uh, the faithful Jews. Uh, Satan is going to be bound and cast into the pit for 1,000 years. Watch what it says. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a 1,000 years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. And set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. Till a thousand years should be fulfilled. After that, he must be loose a little season. Amen. So in this millennium, or excuse me, this second coming of Jesus Christ is, his, is him coming to this earth. 
right? It's not a new heaven, it's not a new heaven and a new earth yet, right? But he's coming to this earth, he's gonna rule and he's gonna reign. And you and I, if we're his elect, we're coming back with him. The Bible says with 10,000 of his saints. And guess what? We're going to be kings and priests. And we're going to rule with him. And we're not going to have bad judgment. We're going to rule with his will. With his perfection. Amen. And we're going to learn. And we're going to do. We're, we're going to make this earth awesome again. It's not going to be perfect. Amen. But we're going to rule with him. And that's the, that's the millennium. Right? So that's, that's his coming. Now we're moving to the millennium. Okay, the millennium is a thousand years. Let's go to, uh, let's go to Isaiah 32. Now, when his work um, in the, that judgment has been completed, right? Because he, like I said, he judged the, he judged the devil, threw him away. And Jesus Christ is going to establish his kingdom here on earth. Right, and Jerusalem is going to be its capital. Bible says that all nations are going to come. He's going to reign over the earth for a thousand years, and it's going to be a time of peace and happiness. It's wonderful. Look at Isaiah chapter thirty-two, verses one through five. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. That's you and us. And a man shall be. As a hiding place from the wind and a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. And the eyes of them that see shall not be dim, and the ears of them that hear shall hearken. The heart also of the rash shall understand knowledge, and the tongue of the stammerers shall be ready to speak plainly. The vile person shall be no more called liberal, nor the churl said to be bountiful. For So, then go to chapter 35, verses 1 through 7. It says, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and bloom as the rose. That's us, okay? It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. God's going to be in this place. His glory is going to be there on earth. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. Remember, I said everything's going to come back, right? He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be stopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, that's a male deer, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. Notice, this is a picture of the world, right? This is not the new heaven and the new earth, but God's presence in the millennium is going to cause things to change. This is God's desire for the, to show the people of the earth, the people who, were, who made it through the tribulation, He's given them one more opportunity to repent. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water in the habitation of dragons, where each lay shall be grass with reeds and, and rushes. And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. But the unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. Now watch this. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs. This is people coming back to Jerusalem and giving God praise and everlasting joy upon their heads. 
They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Folks, I want you to know, God is serious about loving you. I said, God is serious about loving you. Can we just give the Lord a mighty hand praise? Amen, amen, amen. Amen. And the last, let's go to Isaiah 65 and verse 17. I want you to see what's going on. There's going to be, in, in the end, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Notice what he says here. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. This new heaven and this new earth is going to be so much more awesome even than the millennial kingdom. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy and I will rejoice in Jerusalem and my and joy in my people and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in here nor the voice of crying there shall be no more thence an infant of days nor an old man that hath not fulfilled his days for the child shall die a hundred years old they're saying that in the millennial kingdom that if, a, if somebody dies at 100, they're going to feel the same way as if a three-year-old passed away here. That's People are going to live a long time up there, or here, excuse me. But the sinner being a 100-year-old shall be accursed. How many know that sinning takes a lot out of you? Amen. I know some of you only heard about that. But amen. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. How many worry about the future for your kids? How many worry? Am I working for nothing? Can you imagine if you were like a millionaire or a billionaire and you just got notified you made another billion and the doctor comes right behind him and says, hey, I want a word with you. All of a sudden, all that you've done, it's for been for nothing. And the Lord is saying that's not going to happen anymore here. And it shall come to pass before they call. I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Ever had your prayers hit the ceiling like brass and feel like they return void? And then all of a sudden you don't even feel like talking or even to pray to God. It says here that when you're thinking about it, he's going to hear. And when you're talking about it, he's already going to be right there. And notice the last verse. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. Folks, what God has planned for us is wonderful. What time is it? Eight oh three, okay. I had some other things I wanted to talk about, but I'm going to leave it right there because I think that's a good spot. Our God loves us. He wants to reconcile with us. He wants everything to be the way it was. He created Adam and Eve for fellowship. We're not like an animal. He cares for the animals. The Bible says that a righteous man regardeth the life of his beast. I'm not putting them down, but I'm saying we are special. Amen. And he wants to spend eternity with us. And so all of this coming down the road, you and I got to pay attention to it because we've got to be ready. 
I said, we've got to be ready. People in the 70s and 80s and even the 60s, I guess, they lived with an air of expectancy. They are waiting for God to come back and take them. We, can't, we cannot lose that. We have to expect the Lord. Can we stand to our feet? Can we have to expect the Lord back at any moment? You know, it's kind of a weird... I don't know what the word is I'm looking for. It's, it's a weird irony. That as bad as things are now, we're getting more comfortable. Oh, we're bothered by the instability. We're, we're bugged by what we see in the news. But we're not living in expectancy. We're saying that's the way it is. And folks, that's, how, that's why we're getting beaten down in the news. That's why the news is telling us what you believe is wrong about marriage and families. What you believe about boys and girls is wrong. What you believe about this and that, it's all wrong. You've got an outdated morality. Why? Because they want to wear us down. But the way we counter that, we've got to live with expectancy. Our Lord is coming. I said our Lord is coming. Hallelujah. 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 Can you just raise your voices right now? In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, even now. Even so, come now, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. Hallelujah. Lord, we're waiting for you, Jesus. We love you, God. Lord, we don't want to be here anymore. We ask you, God. Lord, make us ready, Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, help us to take everybody with us. Oh, God, bring the souls before us. Give us words, Jesus, that they may believe. Oh, God, make me a warrior for Christ. Make me a testimony for Jesus. Come on, somebody. you got to ask him. you got to you gotta request it. you got to say, Lord, I want to be a witness. I want to be a witness of your goodness. I want to be a witness of your hope. I want to be a witness of salvation. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, Lord Jesus. We bless you, God. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. I just want to encourage us today that we make ourselves ready. Hallelujah. 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 a mother's heart cry. Folks, we need to come to church ready to worship, ready to speak in tongues. And if you feel a, a block in there, listen, I'm not begging you to come to me to confess to me. But I'm begging you to go to Jesus and say, Lord, I need to get this off of my chest. I need to get it off of my shoulders. I need to clear the air with you. I need to put some things under the blood. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm not talking about perfection, but I'm saying, Lord, I, I've come to the end of my ability. I, I, can't, I can't live any better than I'm living. I need you, Jesus. I need you to change me. This is not some kind of admonition on my part to you. I'm talking to me. I'm talking about me. Lord, help me not to be lazy. Lord, help me to just move forward with you, Jesus. 
Bible says, be not weary in well-doing. Anybody ever feel weary in their bones? Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a mighty hand praise. Amen, amen, amen. Get right with God. Get baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And if you got that done, then say, Lord, refill me in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. One more time. Just give the Lord a mighty hand. wanted to give you a preview of the future and with that in your heart and on your mind as you leave here and as you go to be home with relatives and neighbors and friends and co-workers can you tell somebody about the gospel can you tell somebody about the good news that they don't have to face all that trouble and problem that they can go with us to be in the air with Jesus and come and serve him in the millennium. Amen. I didn't even get to the good stuff. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to shut up or else I'll keep going. We have church on Sunday at 11 o'clock. Why don't you come a little bit earlier and just come and pray for a little bit. Amen. There are going to be people practicing their instruments, singing. There are going to be people greeting each other in Jesus' name. There is a buzz that's in this place. That It's a liveliness in the spirit. Come on, some of you early Sunday people. Can you give me can you get a witness for me? Amen. And you have three days. You have three days. Can you ask somebody to come to church? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Amen. And listen, here's my idea. Why don't you ask, if, you, if, if all your neighbors don't want to hear it from you anymore, when you go to the grocery store, start up a conversation with somebody and invite them. Amen. When you all are both testing the bread, that's like over a meal. People feel that. Amen. And guess what? That's an invitation for you to invite them. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Church is at 11 o'clock. God bless you. Greet each other in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Good night.